Good morning, church. Uh, it is a blessing once again to be with you this morning. Um, and what a beautiful morning it is. Uh, after that, uh, you know, that, that the S word from last week. If you're not here on the mountain, you don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, Clear Creek, we've got uh, at least eight to ten inches of that, uh, that, that word. Uh, and I, I, you know what, I'm just, I'm ready for it to be spring. And I'm sure you guys are too. If you're not here on the mountain, you're probably somewhere where it's raining and just kind of gloomy. And this, this last week has just uh, been just incredible. It's been 70s, up close to 70s here. Went down to Chico one day with, uh, with my daughter and her uh, school and, and roamed through uh, Bidwell Park. And what a, what an awesome thing that was. And just, it just rejuvenates you. It just that you see the spring and you see the flowers and the birds and it just makes you, you feel good. And, and it gives you, gives you hope, right? It gives you hope. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about this living hope that God promises us. Uh, before we get to that, um, it's been a little while since I've given you an update on, on myself. Um, number one, uh, it's been a blessing to, to be able to do that nighttime dialysis. You know, it really truly is a blessing. Um, and, and I'm living well and because of that. And, and uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's been a blessing. It's been a, a, even a more of a blessing to have my wife by my side every night. Uh, she works tirelessly. And when my machine is uh, not working right and dinging and doing all these things throughout the night, she's right there beside me. You know, how can I help? What can I do? And, uh, and I'm thankful to have her. I'm also thankful that I have uh, three incredible daughters uh, that love their dad. And uh, I love them deeply. Um, but kind of a selfish plug. I do need more individuals to, to step up and get tested. Um, I, we've gone through the first batch of people that uh, said that they want to be a living donor. And, uh, and none of those were a match. And... Uh, and most of those were not able to, to give just in general for one reason or the other. Um, so if you feel led, if that's something that, that you've been thinking about, um, I could use your help. Um, I do feel awkward asking. Um, but one of the things Pastor John taught me a long time ago was uh, uh, you have not because you ask not. So there it is. Um, I do thank you for your prayers and I covet those prayers and continue to pray for us. Uh, it's working. We're doing well, like I said. Um, I think of, you know, my situation and I think of, of Deborah. And I, and I would like you to, to just uh, lift her up and lift John up into your prayers. Uh, back and forth to San Francisco. I know how that was when I was going back and forth to, to Chico or to, to, to Sacramento. But here they're going to San Francisco and back. And, and Deborah's in a, in a spot where she has to have a, a lung transplant. I'm not two there yet it would be better if I got one um, but I can live and uh, and and like just like I am I am I'm blessed just like I am um, but for Deborah let's uh, let's lift her up and and, and continue prayer for her and uh, John as well and their whole family um, anyways enough of that uh, let's get into the Word this morning. If you got a Bible, let's crack that open. If you got a phone, turn that on. We're going to be in the book of 1 Peter. Uh, Matt spoke, I think, two weeks ago on just the first uh, two verses of 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to be going through 1 Peter 1, 3 through 12 this morning. Um, but before we get into that, while you're doing all that, let me pray for us in our time this morning. Father God, <coughs> we are thankful for your son, Lord. We're thankful for this living hope that, uh, that we as Christians uh, all can enjoy, Lord. This, this hope that goes beyond this world, goes beyond our problems, goes beyond all the struggles and trials that we might be going through today. We can look to that living hope and say, I have an inheritance. It's better over there. And, uh, and, and that cannot be taken away from us. Um, that's something that's eternal. Uh, we're going to talk about that this morning, Lord. We're just so thankful uh, for your word, Lord, so that we can be able to dive into it and look at these different things, Lord, and kind of dissect it and see what you have in store for us, Lord. And it's incredible, incredible. So I just pray for our morning. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling. Lord, who are going through some kind of test or trial or, uh, 
whatever it might be, Lord. And I think of, I lift up Deborah right now to you, Lord, and John, and just pray for that situation, Lord. I pray that you would bring her the perfect set of lungs sooner rather than later, Lord, and that she could start to live once again, Lord. And we just love you, and we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so kind of going back to what Matt talked about last two weeks ago, uh, Peter writes this letter to a church in the midst of suffering, right? This, this, uh, there's been things going on. This, they're, they're suffering because of their faith in Jesus and to a people who might be on the verge of like selling the farm. I mean, they, like, let's get out of this. This is not worth it, right? And, and Matt talked about this backdrop of, uh, uh, of the letter. And so in 64 AD, Nero burned Rome. And then what did he do? He blamed it on the Christians. Christians were being persecuted. They were being fed to lions. They were being beheaded and crucified, burned at the stake. Christians had to go underground, leave their homes or jobs. They were scattered all over the world, and they did not fit comfortably in this dark world. They were strangers, and we're, we're called to be strangers in this world, right? We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be set apart. Some of these things are happening to Christians today, and one of the most severe problems the Christians face today is they don't seem to be strangers. We, we, we seem to be kind of moving uh, more towards uh, the world than we are moving and staying fast and holding fast to our Christian beliefs. Things are getting muddled, and, and things are, there's a gray area. There isn't any gray area. There either is or there isn't. Uh, there's a there's a saying that's that says uh, that if they were gathering all the people that were believers in Christ to kill them, would you be chosen? Would you be one of those people? Would they know? Would they? I I know he's a Christian. I know she's a Christian. We need to kill them. Or would you kind of just kind of blend into the background? Christians should stand out. They should be different than this world. We have been and are being sanctified. And that means we have been set apart. And here in this opening lines of his letter, Peter wishes to give these Christians who are being persecuted some encouragement. And, and us as well. He wants to give us encouragement. He wants to give us a gentle reminder that no matter what you might be facing in your life today, if you have received the gift of salvation, you are unbelievably fortunate. You should have a living hope. So what exactly is it that makes this new life in Jesus so special, right? Let's open our Bibles up to 1 Peter 1, 3 through 12. I want to emphasize in our text today Three features of salvation that should give us this living hope. Three things in just this little text that should give us a living hope. The first thing is the promise is perpetual. The promise is perpetual. Verse 3 through 5 says, Praise be God to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance, listen, that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, God's promises to us who have received his son, this promise of salvation is not temporary. It's not a temporary thing. It's an ongoing thing. It's perpetual. His promise is perpetual, first of all, because he has given us this promise of eternity, right? We say this all the time. We're all going to live forever. It just depends on our address, right? Or our zip code. God promises us eternity in heaven, Verse 4, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, fade, kept in heaven for you. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, 
whom you have sent. Romans 6.22 puts it this way, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. In John 10.28, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. So this idea of it can't be taken away from you, and that it's perpetual, it's ongoing, it's eternal John 5, 24 says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Excuse me, real quick. So if you put your trust in Jesus for salvation, you have this promise, this promise of eternity, a permanent inheritance kept in heaven, where you will be a joint heir with Jesus forever. So no matter what your life on earth looks like, no matter what is spoiled, no matter how your dreams seem to be fading, doesn't matter if you're in a dead-end job or, or a loveless marriage, or doesn't matter what it is, your inheritance in heaven is good. And it's as good as new because our living hope is an eternal promise. It's an ongoing eternal promise. Our inheritance in heaven is genuinely eternal. Nothing on earth can touch it or affect it. No matter what passes away on this earth, it will never pass away. No matter what you're going through. No matter what problems you have right now, they pale to the comparison of what we have in Christ Jesus, this eternal life. And we should have that hope. We should not be dwelling on whatever it is that you're going through today. We're all going through something. Every one of us. But God says there's better, more better to come. We've also been given the promise of protection. Right? So verse 5 says, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Remember, this letter is being written to people who know oppression, right? They're being beheaded, they're being burned, they're being crucified. They're being fed to lions. Peter's spirit-inspired promise to them is that they are shielded from all that the world could throw at them by God's power. And ultimately, no matter what happens... We know that God has us in the palm of his hand. And nothing happens to us that takes our living father by surprise. You know, almost two years ago in uh, July, um, when I was diagnosed with uh, stage four kidney failure, and then a couple weeks later, stage five, I didn't catch God off guard. He, he knew that that was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to happen, right? But he knew exactly and he knows exactly how it's going to end. And I believe that he has given me this hope that it, it, it's been taken care of. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if I get a new kidney. I don't know if my kidneys get healed. I've said this before. But I truly believe I have this hope, this living hope that God has got it. He's got it taken care of. He's let me know that you're going to be all right. Whatever it might be, you're going to be all right. This didn't catch me off guard. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is fas fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me declares the Lord. Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. He's going through it too. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And finally, Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isn't that good news, church? No matter what you're going through, God is going through it too. He's, he's already gone through it. 
and he's taking you through it. We're going to look at that here a little bit later, that all of these things, that these trials that we go through are for our own benefit. And this promise of protection is also a part of God's perpetual promise. It's a two-part promise that God has placed in reserve for you in heaven until you join Him there and partake of your eternal inheritance. He is watching over you. He is shielding you. The second thing that makes our salvation uh, special is our problems are temporary. They're temporary. Whereas God promise, promises to us are permanent, the trials are temporary. This perpetual eternal life, this eternal life, that is permanent. These trials that you're going through right now, they're temporary. Verse 6 through 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had suffering, had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So there is a fact, there's a two part truth here. The first is our trials are temporary, right? In this greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Church, some of you might be saying, what's a little while mean? Right? What is a little while? I can't answer that. I've been going through this for close to two years now. And so, um, but the suffering is not quite suffering anymore because I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to give that to God. Peter says that while we are waiting to receive that eternal inheritance, we can rejoice in our living hope in spite of the fact that right now life may not be so grand. In fact, you may be suffering in all kinds of trials, trials of faith, persecution, physical trials, but these only last for a little while. They are not eternal. Our life with Christ is. We are looking forward to eternity. We should have that hope in eternity. The second part of that is our trials are training us. Okay? We're talking about that refining these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. Peter uses this metaphor of gold being refined by fire to speak of how the trials of our lives prove our faith to be genuine. And they increase our faith. I googled modern refining techniques and they now can profitably extract pure gold from rock that has only one part gold to 300,000 parts of worthless material. Our lives are kind of like that worthless rock that contains a small amount of something very valuable. A small amount of our faith. And through the heat and the pressure of trials, our lives, that precious faith, it's refined and it's made stronger. If we allow it to, if we allow, if we give it to God and think, what is God going to do with this? How great is my God? How powerful is my God? How faithful is my God? So then, not only are promise perpetual, our problems are temporary, and as those as they are passing through our lives, they are also working for our good. Romans 12, 2 says, Be joyful in hope, patience in a, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. 
James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This eternal crown, right? This eternal life with him. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have troubles, Jesus says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Finally, James 1, 2 through 4. I'm sure you've heard this one a lot of times. Consider it pure joy. I don't know how you do that sometimes. But God says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let that perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We need these trials to become complete. The next thing that makes our salvation the salvation that we have in Jesus so great and gives us that living hope is the fact that our pleasure is profound. Verses 8 through 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. This inexpressible joy is also to be the result of two things in our passage. The first is the joy of loving Jesus. Verse 8 says, <clears throat> Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible, glorious joy. See, that's that that set apart, that, that difference in the world when, when we're going through trials, instead of throwing that pity party and, oh, woe is me, we're looking to God on the other end. We're having faith that this we will just suffer for a little while. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. It's that Holy Spirit that... that that we call upon, that gives us this joy, this hope that most people in this world don't have. I think of those uh, people that we met in San Francisco on the streets. There was no hope in their eyes. There was no hope that they would ever leave that place. They were just surviving. There was no more living. There was no more hope. But I remember... Uh, Rick was talking about uh, one of the men that he met. He was kind of sprawled out on the ground. He was drunk. And uh, Rick said to me, he said, you know, that I don't think that he's never going to leave that place. He's never going to get out of there. But he could be saved. He could be saved. He could receive that hope. There's something about loving Jesus that fills our heart with joy that can be found in no other way. John 16, 24 says, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will, you will receive that joy may be full. It makes sense though that when you understand that loving him, being in a relationship with him is what we were made for in the beginning. We were made for him. Knowing Jesus and loving him is like finding the heart's true home. We experience this usually the first time at the moment when we put our trust in him and receive him and his gift of salvation. But we can experience it again and again every time we meet with him in heartfelt fellowship, thanksgiving, and service. So our, our pleasure is profound also because we have a joy of being redeemed. Verse 9, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of grace that was to come searched intently 
and with the greatest care. There's just something about knowing that the most important things are taken care of. Your eternal existence has been taken care of. I don't know if you're like me, but I like to do the, the, the most worrisome task first, right? As, as I go through my days, I want to get through the first, you know, the, the most worrisome, like this week, uh, I wanted to get this, this, uh, this written, this, this talk that we're, I'm giving today. I wanted to get it written. I wanted to get it finished so that I can refine it right and so i can make it better but i had to get it finished first i had to finish my my work i had to finish my research and there's that sigh of relief when the most difficult part of your project or of your day or of your week is done the spiritual parallel to that is what peter mentions here in verse 9 we have inexpressible joy because we know the most important thing the eternal thing is taken care of it's the joy of being redeemed of having the burden of your sins lifted by the fact that the blood of Jesus has paid your price of knowing your account is settled and knowing that you have been found guilty in the eyes of the or un, not guilty in the eyes of the Lord it's even better than the feeling uh, that my wife gets when the bills are paid Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the, by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And there's one more thing that makes our salvation a special thing. And that's the fulfillment of God's plan. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be, be revealed in us. So the fulfillment of God's plan. Verse 11, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. So we live in a time that God was planning all along. The remedy for sin is in place. The Messiah has come. The price has been paid. Rejoice. The things that the prophets had been promising by the Spirit of God have already taken place. Isaiah 12, 1 says, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for through you were angry. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. And behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength, my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Our salvation is a fulfillment of God's plan. And it's also a fulfillment of the prophet's living hope. Verse 12 says it was real to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke. Even the angels long to look into these things. What he's saying here, remember he's remember once again he's, he's writing to this suffering church, a persecuted church, a church that could easily have thrown a big church pity party and said, oh, woe is us. But Peter's word through the Spirit of God is don't think this is the worst of times. This is a time those heroes of the Old Testament wished they could live in. This was a time that they predicted. This is the time of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, even the angels in heaven are envious of our salvation. So our, our, our salvation should be our living hope. Through the promise that it is perpetual that there are problems are temporary and our pleasures are profound. Church, the question is, do you really have that living hope? Do you have faith that things will get better? Do you have faith in what God has promised us? 
this eternal life with him. No more suffering, right? We talk, I talked about this a few, few weeks ago. The new earth, the new heavens. It's going to be incredible. And that's what we have to live for, for the rest of our existence, for eternity. Do you throw a pity party every time, think, every time that things don't go your way? Or do you rejoice in knowing that our will, that, that our God will be working in your trials and refining you through all kinds of struggles? If you don't know Christ as your Savior and you don't have this living hope, I'd like to give you an opportunity this morning right now to invite Jesus to be your Lord, your Savior. If you bow your heads and pray with me this morning. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I admit that I'm not right with you and I want to be right with you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. The Bible says if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I will be saved. I believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for a living hope of eternal life spent with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, once again, if you prayed that prayer this morning, church, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, give me a give me a call or Pastor Matt or John and just let us know that you that you've made that choice. And we would love to come alongside you, walk with you through those next steps. Um, we would love to just uh, be with you through this new life, uh, this new eternal life, this hope that you have received. Um, other thing is, is we'd love to hear, you know, we pray for you and uh, sometimes you guys send us uh, uh, different prayer requests and things of that nature. We would love to hear how God is working through those. Um, it would be a blessing to hear how God has answered some of those prayers. So please share that with us. Um, if you can't do that in person, you know, send us an email, shoot us an email, uh, get Sarah, uh, send her an email. We'd love to hear uh, how God is working in your lives. And we'd love to see you back here at church. Some of you guys are snowbirds and it's spring. So come on back. We'd love to have you here. And uh, we'd love to fellowship with you and love on you. Um, thank you for, uh, for, for being here this morning. And I pray that God blesses your week.